everyone. Well, thanks so much. Apologies for the last couple minutes of, uh, you know, uh, technical uh, wrangling, as always ha happens. Uh, thank you so much for attending our uh, first ever uh, Monitoring for Adaptive Management uh, BLM AIM and Many Friends uh, Symposium. My name is Emily Kuchergis, uh, and I'm a landscape ecologist with the National Operations Center. Um, and uh, I, with a whole team of people, organized this symposium. Um, we've got a great lineup of speakers uh, here today. Um, and my goal with this intro presentation is especially just to uh, give you all uh, kind of an update on kind of what uh, BLM AIM, uh, which stands for Assessment, Inventory, and Monitoring, uh, is, uh, as well as kind of uh, give you a sneak preview of all the different presentations that you're going to hear today. So um, with that said, um, I also wanted to kind of point out that um, it's uh, really great to uh, have uh, so many people from kind of diverse walks of uh, race, I guess. Um, and so, you know, while I'm talking about uh, BLM AIM uh, specifically, I think there's really a lot of kind of overlap and uh, synergies with other uh, programs as well. So um, anyway, so I'm going to jump right in. And apologies, we're uh, streaming this on the phone, and for some reason the beeps are beeping. So anyway, sorry about the beeps. So. So first, I'm just going to put this in a little bit of context. And I think this is really um, has to do with uh, the land specifically, but also kind of rangelands all over uh, the U.S. So, um, and the world. So increasingly, uh, you know, there's uh, all these benefits that are being recognized from rangeland ecosystem services, like clean water, uh, stable soil, uh, and healthy wildlife habitat, but then there's an uh, increasing number of uses as well of these range plants that we want to do. Um, so, you know, livestock grazing, recreation, oil and gas development, you name it. And I would say that, you know, the demand both for the benefits and the uses uh, is increasing. And so our challenge as land management agencies and land managers is to figure how to maintain that balance. In addition, increasingly, our land management efforts have to not just focus on one scale, our favorite, favorite pasture, or, you know, our favorite uh, mountainside, but to really look at, you know, multiple scales from, uh, you know, the flatlands down low to the tablelands up high, um, and even beyond the horizon, beyond where we can see. So just some examples of specific um, kind of issues that uh, BLM uh, faces and that you're going to hear about in the symposium today. Um, you know, we're interested uh, in Washington and Congress particularly is interested in the national condition of rangeland in knowing that. So you're going to hear uh, a bunch of different uh, presentations uh, first this morning um, from BLM, NRCS, and Forest Service to uh, look at the national condition of rangeland. Um, then we're also interested in habitat of this uh, SP sage grouse species that I'm sure you've heard a lot about this week. Um, we, you know, kind of stepping down in scale. Uh, we want to think about regional mitigation for energy development, uh, land use plan effectiveness. Uh, again, if you're specific to be a land, but if you're a rancher, you want to think about your whole ranch. Um, emergency stabilization and rehabilitation, post-fire treatment, grazing permit renewal, recreation, reclamation, you know, kind of stepping down to those finer scales. So the rest of the presentation uh, in the morning are going to uh, focus on um, those kind of some case studies on those smaller uh, scale efforts. Um, and so kind of in that context of multiple benefits and multiple scales, uh, we're also really trying to, and I think hopefully improving over time, 
our ability to do adaptive management. And y'all have seen this all before, but it's, you know, just a structured decision-making process where you first plan out uh, what you're trying to do, um, then you actually do it, uh, and then hopefully, and this is a really key step in it, you learn uh, from what you did uh, and make adjustments if, if what you're doing uh, needs to change. Um, and so uh, the goal of the assessment inventory and monitoring strategy, and really I would argue that the role of information in land management is to really enable this learning step to occur. So the AIM strategy was a document uh, published in 2011. You can uh, see a picture of it right there. Um, but it really grew out of all of these uh, kind of pieces of context that I talked about. Um, and the goal of the AIM strategy is to report on the status and trends of public rangelands at multiple scales of inquiry, to report on the effectiveness of management actions, and to provide the information necessary to implement adaptive management. So here's just a roadmap. I'm going to talk about kind of the principles of AIM, but which I would argue, again, are general principles that uh, could be applied to monitoring in many different situations um, on rangelands and beyond. And then I'm also, uh, as I said, going to uh, highlight some of the symposium talks that are going to talk uh, about these principles. So the first principle of AIM is just to standardize uh, and to quantify uh, monitoring indicators uh, and measurements. So kind of first and foremost, this is standardization. And what that enables is easy comparisons of measurements collected in different places. Uh, so that's really key to kind of scaling up in the inferences that we can draw to those larger scales. So on the terrestrial side, um, we've got six uh, core indicators um, collected using three main methods, uh, bare ground, vegetation, composition, plant species of management concern, and non-native and invasive species uh, collected using line point intercepts. Uh, we've got height, which is just a direct measurement, um, and then uh, canopy gap uh, collected using canopy gap intercepts. Um, and these were, the idea is that any time you go out and do monitoring, you would collect uh, all of these indicators because it really together provides a suite of information um, about these terrestrial ecosystems um, that you can use for multiple applications. Uh, but of course, sometimes we need to know additional information as well. And so supplemental indicators should, of course, be added. Uh, when uh, there are additional pieces of information that we need. Just to give you some documents to look at, uh, the core terrestrial indicators and methods, kind of the process that was used to identify them, um, and as well as the indicators themselves is, are described in BLM Tech Note 440, uh, core terrestrial indicators and methods. And then the actual protocol document is the monitoring manual for grassland, shrubland, and savanna ecosystems. And uh, I think we have some copies on that back table, and if we don't, then we will later today. And I was told that they are not being uh, carried on a plane back to wherever they came from. So please feel free to take one. I also wanted to highlight that this is an interagency effort, and so we'll hear more about that really throughout um, these presentations uh, today. But, uh, you know, the NRCS is the same methods they use for NRI, um, you know, uh, Forest Service, ARS, and USGS have all uh, played a part in this as well. But it's not only terrestrial ecosystems that we manage um, on the, the our rangeland landscape. So uh, there's been a, an aquatic effort as well to identify aquatic core indicators, and so you'll hear from Scott Miller, the lead of that effort, um, in a few presentations from now, um, and you can see the aquatic core indicators uh, listed below, but same, same uh, general basic idea. Um, the second principle of AIM is just to use a statistically valid uh, scalable sampling design. 
And this again addresses this challenge that we have of the multiple scales uh, of land management um, that we're needing to have information to inform our decision making at, such that you can, uh, it enables you to collect information kind of on a small area, uh, like these six allotments in Nevada, but then use that information to inform conditions in uh, the broader uh, BLM district, uh, in the broader BLM uh, state of Nevada, or in the eco region as well. And really, you could use any, I mean, a big BLM boundary, so you could use any boundaries in this example. All right, a third principle of AIM, and uh, under some probably, but extremely, extremely important principle, is just to uh, manage data. And uh, two things, two aspects of this uh, pictured here are to uh, capture data electronically uh, whenever possible. Um, so on the terrestrial side, we uh, usually use tablets. On the aquatic side, I believe they have an iPad app. Um, but then, uh, and then that really facilitates the easy storage of data uh, as well in kind of an enterprise database format versus uh, the old way of storing data, which is huge boxes. And uh, don't get me wrong, I have a lot of huge boxes. So um, you'll hear uh, not a, a ton about this in the talk today, but um, it is really important, and uh, Sarah Lamagna in the last talk of the day will talk some about it. And she's also got a poster, uh, actually there's a couple posters on this topic in the poster session uh, during lunch. The final principle of AIM uh, is uh, to, whenever uh, you know possible, take advantage of the fact that we're collecting all this great field-based information um, and integrate that with remote sensing to produce uh, kind of uh, remote sensing products, either to validate you know the remote sensing product you've already created, or actually to train and help create that product. So you'll hear um, some of our uh, own efforts with UASs from Chris Cole this afternoon, uh, as well as uh, some of our partnerships with uh, Land Fire and with the Grass Shrub uh, stewardship efforts um, during our little remote sensing section this afternoon. A final principle of AIM is just to be thoughtful. Um, just like if you're, you were constructing a building, uh, or something like that. So start from, you know, a strong foundation of really figuring out what your questions are and developing your monitoring program. Uh, and then uh, implement it, of course. Uh, evaluate the data that you've collected and adjust your monitoring if it's needed. Uh, then repeat the monitoring uh, annually. Um, in order to continue to gather your data and then use that to inform adaptive management. And that's going to be the focus of most of the case studies uh, that we've got here today is really this using the data piece. So just to summarize, um, the whole idea and impetus of AIM is to um, have this one core data set across BLM land and, you know, potentially beyond as well. Um, and collect that information once, but then use it uh, many times for the many different kind of purposes and uses that we um, have to, and benefits that we have to uh, be providing information about. Uh, to finish up, I just wanted to give you all a quick kind of sneak peek of um, if you, you know, put a dot on the landscape everywhere, where uh, this new standard approach to data collection on BLM lands uh, has happened. Uh, here it is. So um, the red dots, it's kind of hard to see, uh, but are uh, terrestrial, um, kind of more project focused. Um, the kind of brown dots, I think, are the more extensive national monitoring, the landscape monitoring framework that SHRM is going to talk about, um, and then we've got aquatic points as well, um, I think in blue and green. Uh, so anyway, just to, just to give you an idea of the kind of the scale of efforts, this started in uh, 2011, by the way. 
I wanted to say a quick thanks uh, to the National AIM team, but particularly to all my co-presenters uh, here, uh, many of them uh, AIM state monitoring coordinators, uh, as well as uh, kind of AIM project leads on various field offices uh, around the BLM. Um, and then as well as our many collaborators, uh, many of whom are presenting today, uh, the USDA ARS Tornado Experimental Range, um, NRCS, USGS, uh, Great Basin Institute, and also collect collecting data, as well as Chicago Botanic Garden, Geo4, others, Alaska Natural Heritage Program, Iowa State University, many, many more. This is a huge group effort, y'all. So with that, um, I'll close and take any questions at this time. Go ahead. It is available. We're working to make it available online, so it's more just like a download type thing. But um, in the interim, uh, if you contact me, uh, we can do data sharing agreements with folks. Okay, so I've got a concern, and the concern I have is that if you're monitoring rangelands, up and rangelands, what's important is the attributes that you want to look at, ground cover, et cetera. There may be a variety of things that you want to look at, and yet this system is constraining more to a method, and I'm more a generalist and would consider that the method of choice is appropriate in many places, but you may have another method you want to use in another place using like the interagency technical guide for monitoring. You pick a method that's telling you what you want to do on your piece of country mm -hmm. that this is being tied into a national emphasis mm -hmm. and it limits the, the adaptable nature of being able to do different types of monitoring. Yeah, so, you know, there's a tension, right? If all of our monitoring was small scale and all of our inferences that we wanted to make were to small scale areas, then I think you're totally right. You could just adapt away for different areas as possible. But the AIM strategy was actually based on um, a review of BLM task monitoring uh, kind of efforts. And one thing they learned from that effort is that at large scale, uh, they could not actually learn uh, really anything from the huge diversity of uh, indicators and methods that have been collected in the past. And so, um, you know, that's kind of uh, why this direction uh, has been taken. And I think from Sarah this afternoon, you're going to hear some great examples of how uh, coordinating can have cross-boundary, uh, cross, like, interagency kind of benefits as well. So um, one other kind of clarification, you can always collect additional uh, information, additional supplemental indicators if you're interested in that, um, that, you know, encourage that. Uh, and you'll actually hear from, for example, the folks on the north slope of Alaska that have done that. Um, so uh, anyways, I guess uh, I hear your concern, but uh, it's driven by there's a reason for, for the ways that it's coming down. Yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry, webinar people. <laughs> <laughs>